what solution concepts were implied by those properties or those axioms. Okay, and this gave us the very productive ideas of Nash equilibrium and rationalizability um, on many of these, their neighbors and their refinements. And then a little bit after that, behavioral game theorists came in and they started looking at actual play in lab experiments and writing models that described what they were seeing in the lab. So this is a little bit different, but all of these models are still going to be simple, interpretable models that have a nice narrative with them. And this has been several decades of work. Now, more recently, James Wright over there, Kevin Leighton Brown, hi James, <laughs> um, and Jason Hartford have been suggesting a second approach, which I think is very interesting. Um, and their idea, James will tell you a lot more about it in a moment, but let me just briefly summarize now. The idea is that instead of conjecturing a simple interpretable model, what we might do is actually just take a lot of data of gameplay, train a predictive algorithm on that data, and then use this algorithm to predict future play. So this is a neat idea, and actually a lot of this talk is going to have that flavor as well. All right. But the focus of what I'm going to tell you now is that it's going to be to produce um, a, yet a third approach. All right. And our idea is that in addition to querying the theorist's intuition and querying perhaps an algorithm's intuition, one more thing we can try is to query the crowd's intuition. And what I mean by that is we can aggregate a lot of non-expert opinions about playing games and use that towards prediction. Now, this isn't actually obviously a good idea at all. all right, so crowdsourcing is a technique that's been pretty successful in machine learning, um, but it's primarily been used by people like crowd vision, um, sorry, computer vision people. Right? And how it's been used is primarily for tasks like this one. Right? So what a computer vision person might do is go onto a platform like Mechanical Turk and have a lot of human subjects do labeling exercises. So we might ask, is there a cat in this photo? Right? But Humans happen to be experts at determining whether or not there are cats in photos. So I, I don't think anybody here has any problem answering this question. Right. This is a significantly less trivial question. So what I'm showing you here is a three by three normal form game. It's a pretty simple game. Right. And the question is, what action is likeliest to be chosen by people in the role of the role player? So not so clear that the random mechanical Turk subject is going to know anything about this question, but nevertheless, this is what we wanted to try. So in order to do this, first we needed a lot of actual game play behavior that could be predicted. And here, uh, James and Kevin were kind enough to lend us a data set that they've aggregated across seven to eight different experimental game theory papers. So what happened is that many of these authors in the third bullet, here Stalin, Wilson, and other people, <coughs> Um, have written several papers in which they invited subjects, usually college students, into labs, showed them games, asked them to play these games, and recorded the, the behavior right, for other questions, but we can take their data, essentially. And I'm going to use a subset of James and Kevin's data, which consists of symmetric 3x3 three three normal form games. So there's 86 unique games. Each of these games is played between 40 and 147 times. The subject pools are varying across the different games, and the incentive treatments and all of that are, are, are different across these games. However, they have this common structure of being simple, normal form games and having no repetition. And on top of this, we're going to add some new data, which is the human predictions. So how did we obtain this? What we did is we went onto this platform, Mechanical Turk. If you're not familiar with it, it's an online platform where you can pay people from across the world to do very small tasks for you. And the first thing we had to do is actually teach these people a little bit about game theory, because most of these people have never studied game theory. So we gave them a brief introduction to what a game is. And then we showed each of these subjects 15 games. And we told them that these games were in fact played by real people. So these are the real people. And then we asked them to produce one of two possible predictions. So in the first treatment, we asked the subjects to simply predict the action that was most frequently chosen by the row player. And in the second treatment, we asked these subjects to do the slightly harder task of ranking the actions from most likely to be chosen to least likely to be chosen. And then to properly incentivize our answers, what we told them is that in addition to a base payment, which they were guaranteed simply by <laughs> completing our task, they would receive a bonus for every game that they predicted correctly. 
And in the, the first case, that's pretty simple. What that means is that the action that you predicted as most frequently chosen was in fact the action that was most frequently chosen. Um, and then in the second case, we demanded that their entire ordering be correct. And just to give you a sense of what this looked like, here's a typical so question. Them that real people are college students? No. Real people. We, just, we just told them people. We were very vague about it. Yeah. OK. So this is an example screen that we showed for the, the first treatment. So here's a 3 by 3 normal form game. You can ignore the coloring. This is you know, a way we were teaching them the game. And the question is, which move do you think was most frequently chosen by the orange player, which is the row player? And then they simply gave us an answer. You know, I think A was the most likely action to be chosen, for example. Right, so that's the first treatment. Here's an example for the second treatment. So again, a 3 by 3 normal form game. And now we're asking them to give us an ordering over the, the possible row player actions. So fairly simple. So I said predict play. What do I mean by that exactly? We looked at two different prediction tasks. Okay, so the first task we looked at is, if I show you a game, and by that I mean a payoff matrix, okay, and I select a particular instance of play, okay, I'm going to hide that instance of play. I'm going to ask you to guess what the row player did in that particular observation. Okay, that's the first task. So a prediction rule is just going to be any function that maps the space of payoff matrices, 3 by 3 payoff matrices, so that's just r to the 18. <laughs> into an element of the set of row player actions. Okay, so that's the first task. And the second task we looked at is a little bit harder. So we looked at, if I show you a payoff matrix, can you predict the distribution over play that's going to be realized if many subjects play this game? How many observations do you have for the, for the original set to generate the distribution? So for this one, in this data, we have 86 unique games and between 40 and 147 instances of play for each. So here, a prediction rule is going to be any function that maps the space of payoff matrices into a distribution over the row player actions. Right, and the question is, how are we going to construct these prediction rules? So we're going to take three different approaches. The first thing we're going to do is we're just going to just base a prediction rule off of behavioral game theory. And I'll tell you about the specific model we chose and, and what we did there. Okay? And then we're also going to train predictive algorithms using machine learning. And the question here is going to be, what feature spaces do we want to use for these algorithms? And we're going to compare two different choices of feature spaces. So the first feature space we constructed essentially pulled, drew in my knowledge of, of the literature and game theory, the, the theoretical literature and the experimental literature of everything we thought that might be strategically relevant about the payoff matrix. Right, so we constructed a large number of features off of that, and we're going to take that to be the feature space. And then we're going to contrast that with a second feature space that consists solely of features based on the crowd predictions. And I'll be a little bit more precise about what I mean by that in a moment, but this is going to be a substantially smaller feature space. And importantly, these features are not going to know anything about the payoff matrix directly. So if they have any signal content about play, this signal content is going to be filtered through the perception of the human subjects who are predicting behavior. No, you don't see anything. I give you a payoff matrix. And I ask, you know, I say, look at this payoff matrix, and what action do you think is most likely to be chosen by a subject in the role of the row player? And then using that, you extract features in a way that you haven't yet described. Exactly. And use those to train an algorithm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's no teaching of these subjects, and there's no feedback during the experiment. One question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're asking why not just generate the empirical, the true distribution of play and use that directly. Yeah, so that would be fine if we had a large number of observations of play for each of the games. Um, and we were willing to do that for every new game that we wanted to predict. Right? But the goal here is going to be to have something that's slightly more generalizable. So the idea is that if we can train predictive algorithms on features themselves, 
then we can use these algorithms to predict behavior in new games, as well as the games in which we actually have training data for. What if we use the observations we currently have from how people play? Yes, OK. So that's, that's a very interesting comment. And I want to get back to that in much more detail when I actually show you the results. So, so remind me if, if I don't get, you know. You still need, for a new game, the, fe the, the actual values for the features which, for the new game, which means you have to ask people what Absolutely. Other, other people will play. Absolutely, yeah. So there is a slight distinction, but actually this is actually going to be a question of what exactly is this a distinction. Um, but there's a distinction between the predictions of play and the actual gameplay behavior themselves. In Exante, there's actually no reason to expect these to be even necessarily similar. Right? Yeah, but, so, but yeah. In order to make a prediction for a new game, you'd still need to ask people what they think other people would play in that game. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, each subject is going to predict 15 games. So, um, so after every game, do we tell them whether they got it correct? No, so there's no feedback. Yeah, so one more comment on, on this interesting um, discussion. So one additional thing, and it, so we care about prediction. And another thing we care about is just understanding what humans understand about games. So that's going to be a secondary goal. And so let me get back to both of those in a moment. OK, so to be a little bit more precise about what these prediction rules are, and here, actually, I'm not gonna, still not going to give too much detail, um, the behavioral game theory model we're going to use is what's known as the cognitive hierarchy model. And this is a model that's pretty well known in the literature. So the basic idea here is that there is varying different levels of sophistication that a player might have. So a level zero player is the maximally unsophisticated player. And what he does is he just randomizes over his actions. A level one player is a slightly more sophisticated player. What he does is he best responds to the level zero player. So I suppose that my opponent is randomizing uniformly, okay, and I'm going to best respond to that. And then we can define recursively higher and higher levels of sophistication. So a level K player thinks that his opponent is somewhere between zero and K minus one, and he's going to best respond to that. And um, they have a favorite distribution that we're going to use, which is going to be parameterized also by values that they've suggested in, in their papers. Okay, so that's the first prediction rule. All right, so now, the first machine learning prediction rule. We sat down and we defined 70 features that were based on the payoff matrix. So each of these features is, is a function of, of the, the matrix. And example features include things like, for each action, is it part of a pure strategy Nash equilibrium? Is it strictly dominated? Is it part of the action profile that maximizes the sum of player payoffs? So these are all things that seem strategically relevant, right? Or, or things that might matter for play. Okay, so we have 70 features like this. And the plan is to identify every game with a feature vector. And then to learn a predictive rule, not from the space of payoff matrices into the space of outcomes, but from the space of features into the space of outcomes. So that's going to be a coarser, a coarser rule. And we use various different algorithms to do that. Um, so we try lasso decision trees, random forest, neural nets. Uh, this is two-layer neural nets. I think James is going to present that this is going to be the focus of, of his talk. I don't want to, I need to stop foreshadowing your talk. Um, but the focus of what I'm going to tell you now is not going to be on which algorithm is best. So I'm just going to show you the results for the best algorithm that we tried. All right. And then we're going to contrast that with these crowd features. So this is really the emphasis of what we're doing. We constructed two different sets of possible crowd features based off of the prediction data. So the first thing we did is we went to the predict the most likely action experiment. So this is where people gave us a single element of the, the row player um, actions. And we defined for each possible answer the fraction of subjects uh, that chose that prediction to be alpha with the corresponding index. Okay, so we have alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 corresponding to the three possible row player actions. So that's the feature space with three features. From the predict the ranking experiment, we did the same thing. We looked at the fraction of people who predicted ranking K. So we're going to order the, we're going to index the rankings and we're going to define beta one through beta six. So six features here. Okay. And we can do the same thing that we did previously with a very large feature space here with these much smaller feature spaces. So we can train predictive algorithms that are going to map features describing the game, which is now the, the crowd predictions, into outcomes for these games. Right. And I'm going to show you those machine learning outcomes. And I'm also going to show you one more thing, which is that there is a very simple algorithm one could possibly learn from these crowd predictions using no machine learning, using no data. 
Right? And that's just to take the action that was most frequently predicted in the most likely uh, treatment experiment. Right? So we can simply look at these alphas, okay? look at which one is the largest, we're going to predict the corresponding action. So I'll also show you how well that prediction rule does. Right, are there any questions about this? Because it's okay. All right. So I'm going to start with the first task. This is the task of predicting the action that is realized in a particular observation of play. And I'm going to assess error here using the misclassification rate. So it, this is just the error that corresponds to uh, if you pr correctly predict the action that's realized, you have an error of zero. If you incorrectly predict it, you have an error of one. And we're going to average that across all of the observations. And just to give you a better way of understanding these misclassification rates that are going to come out, I'm going to offer you two benchmarks. So there's one prediction rule that's very trivial, which is simply to predict each action with equal probability. Right? If we do that, we're going to get a misclassification rate of two-thirds. The three possible actions are going to be run two-thirds of the time. Right? So we're going to take that to be sort of an upper benchmark on prediction error. You really should be doing better than that. And then I'm also going to show you the error corresponding to a best possible rule, okay, which is for each game to predict the action that is, in fact, most frequently chosen in that game. Now, this error is not going to be zero, because for each game we have many different observations, and players aren't always picking the same thing. So even if you pick the action that is most frequently chosen, you're going to be wrong in some fraction of the answers. Right. But this offers a lower benchmark on what we could hope to achieve in predicting the data. Right. So here I have the naive benchmark and the best possible. So again, these are our, our baselines. Okay. Here's how we do using the cognitive hierarchy model. Right. Always on the left column, I'm going to show you the true misclassification rate. And on the right column, I'm going to show you a normalized misclassification rate. So how we can understand this 0 0.1780 is this is telling us what fraction of the attainable achievement on the naive baseline is in fact achieved by this particular prediction rule. Right? So what this is telling us is that the cognitive hierarchy model is achieving roughly 80% of the possible achievement, um, of the possible improvement on the prediction error. So basically it's doing very well. Okay, but surprisingly, a naive use of the crowd features. So recall, this is the one in which we didn't use any machine learning. All we did is we took the answer that was most frequently predicted by subjects, and we took that to be our prediction. Okay, so this naive prediction rule using crowd features is actually doing better. And this gets us to roughly 90% of the possible improvement on the baseline. Using machine learning, we, get, we do better. So this is now machine learning using the 70 game features that I briefly mentioned to you. Which algorithm? Um, this one corresponds to a random forest. Yeah. Okay. So using the game features, we can get up to now about 96% of the possible improvement. And then interestingly, using machine learning, with the crowd features alone, so again, I want to emphasize that these features don't know anything about the payoff matrix explicitly. This does even better. So now we're at roughly 99% of the possible improvement um, <coughs> on the baseline. We're, we're essentially almost to the best possible rule. Right? And actually combining all of the game features and the crowd features doesn't really do better. So here we just have some, some error. So what this suggested to us is that these crowd features have signal content in them. And interestingly, it's signal content that's not captured by the behavioral models and also not captured by our 70 game features. So sitting down and enumerating all of these different things that might matter strategically and allowing a machine learning algorithm to use these 70 features in a sophisticated way are not capturing somehow something that the subjects, these crowd people, are knowing. So now let's go to the slightly harder task of predicting the distribution of play. And here we're going to assess error using the total variation error. So we're going to look at the actual frequency of play, and we're going to look at the predicted frequency vector. We're going to take the L1 norm. 
And here again, we have two natural benchmarks that we can use for interpreting this number that I'm going to show you. So again, there's a naive prediction rule. This prediction rule is going to be to predict one third, one third, one third for every game. Okay, this constant prediction in every single game. And again, there's a best possible prediction rule. And here, this best possible prediction rule is going to be to predict the actual realized empirical frequency vector. Okay, and in this case, that is going to get us to zero. How am I doing on time, by the way? Nine more minutes. Okay, so let me go through this faster. Okay, so here's the naive benchmark in the best possible. Okay, here's the cognitive hierarchy model. So it still does very well, actually. Not as well as in the other task, not too surprising, it's a much harder task. Okay. Machine learning using game features alone does better. Gets us to roughly, you know, like 80%, a little bit shy of that, of the possible improvement. Using the crowd features here does worse than machine learning using the game features alone. Okay. But using all of the features, using the game features combined with the crowd features, does the best, and it gets us to roughly 80% of the possible improvement. So again, suggesting that there is something, there is, there is some signal content in the crowd features that is not captured by the game features, even for this harder task. Okay. So then we thought, well, that's kind of interesting, but these lab games are special games. Right? So what happens is you just imagine that for each of these papers, an experimental game theorist sat down and thought, well, I can only ask well, I can only show 12 games to these subjects, and I need to say something interesting after showing 12 games. So you're not going to pick 12 random games. You're going to pick 12 very interesting games. Right? So we don't know so far whether the results that I've shown you are special to these non-generic lab games that have been selected or whether they're features more generally of, of games. So what we did is we augmented that data with 200 new games. And these new games have random payoffs. So each of these 18 payoffs is going to be determined uniformly at random from 10, 20 through 90. Right? And the scale was just chosen to match the lab games as well as possible. Right? And I'll skip the incentivization. Subjects were incentivized. Right? So we have new data for random games. And then we're just going to ask exactly the same questions using exactly the same prediction rules. And the main takeaway here is that the answers are qualitatively all the same as before. Right? So here, the cognitive hierarchy model is doing very well. The naive use of crowd features does better. Okay. Machine learning using game features alone does better. Crowd features does the best. Right. And also gets us to roughly 97% of the attainable improvement on, a, on the prediction error. So this machine learning is learning from the new stuff or just learning from the parameters you learned from previous games? This is learning on the training on the new data. Training on the, training new, on the new data, data yeah. <coughs> yeah. So it's not a transfer learning, but that would be an interesting question too. Okay, and again, qualitatively the same. Actually, here the machine learning using the crowd features does better than machine learning using game features, but otherwise the story is very, very similar. Right? So this suggests that the findings are in fact robust or not special to the lab games that I showed you. Okay, and then just two final questions to wrap up, so to better understand these predictions. Um, so one thing you might ask is, how much does predictiveness vary across different individuals? Or in fact, are individuals even predictive? Right, so knowing that these crowd predictions can be used in an algorithm to predict doesn't tell you anything about whether humans are actually correctly predicting. Right, so for any, any, any bijective function from the true answer to the crowd function answer, right, some algorithm will perfectly predict even if, in fact, humans are wrong in every single, um, in every single case. Right, so here what we're going to do is we're going to try to separate um, individual accuracy from this crowd accuracy. And then a second thing we can ask is how much does predictability, ver predictability vary across games? And here the thing to note is that even if these reported prediction errors are pretty good, that's confounding two possibilities. So one is that there's some subset of games which are very predictable, and we're getting those correct. All right? And some that are very difficult to predict, and we're getting those wrong. That's different from the case in which we're predicting all of the games equally well, but sort of imperfectly. Right? So we want to tease out these two things. Okay. So if we're looking at the predictability of individuals, what we're going to do is we're going to take each subject Recall that each subject gives us 15 answers. And then we're going to define an accuracy score to be the fraction of games that he predicted correctly. Okay, we're just going to look at this observed distribution of accuracy scores across subjects. And we're going to contrast that with the distribution we would expect to see if, in fact, these subjects were just guessing at random. Okay. So here's the comparison for four different cases. So in all of these figures, 
blue is the observed distribution of accuracy scores, and orange is this distribution that corresponds to guessing at random. <coughs> Top left is accuracy scores defined using predicting the most likely action on the lab data. And here, I mean, and actually, so in all of these, these distributions are statistically different. Okay? And here it's very stark. Right? The subjects, the actual accuracy of C scores are much better than what we would see if they were guessing at random. This is predicting the most likely action on the McTurk data. And on the bottom, we have predicting the rankings in the lab data and in the McTurk data. And the story here across all of this is that these humans are actually guessing correctly. Right? So it's not just that we're doing interesting crowd aggregation, but they actually seem to know something. All right? And then for looking at how much predictability <coughs> varies across games, we can do a similar exercise. So now we can fix each game and define the predictability of that game to be the fraction of subjects that correctly predicted that game. And then we can contrast that with what we would expect to see if, in fact, all of these predictions were independent. Right, so we can look at the, the mean predictability score across all games. Okay, and suppose that each prediction is correct with Bernoulli with uh, probability mu. All right, and here is what we get for that. So again, blue is the observed distribution of predictability scores, and orange is what we would expect to see under this independent baseline. So top left is predicting the most likely action in the lab data. Okay, top right, same thing, McTurk data. Bottom one's, again, predicting the ranking. And the story here is that there is significantly less variation in the independent baseline than in fact, in what we observe. So this seems to suggest that, one second, so this seems to suggest that, in fact, there are games that are more predictable and games that are less predictable. And I'm not going to show you here, but we've started a preliminary exercise in, in looking into which games are predictable and whether we can, in fact, predict predictability. Yeah. And this is the predictability of games according to, to your subject pool, not the algorithm, tra the trained algorithm. Oh, sorry. So this is, OK, good. So that, that's a very good question. So these predictability <coughs> scores are defined in two different ways. So I don't recall if I'm showing you using the naive crowd algorithm or using the machine learning trait on the crowd algorithms. But they are they're defined with respect to a particular prediction rule. OK, and I think I have like one more minute left, so I'm, I'm just going to conclude. OK, so I want to, one more, one final thought also on, on these questions right after this. But so predicting economic behaviors has been traditionally seen to be the realm of experts. And more recently, it's also been seen to be the realm of algorithms. And the real takeaway from what I've shown you today is that in this problem, at least, of predicting play in games, which is not the hardest task in the world, it's not predicting inflation, okay? um, but it seems non-trivial also. In this task, crowd predictions seem to have signal content that's not captured by behavioral models and also not captured by a reasonably sophisticated use of a very large number of game features. So what this demonstrates is that humans potentially have useful intuitions into strategic behaviors, even ones that are moderately complex. And that there's potential, perhaps, for leveraging crowdsourcing towards prediction of economic behaviors. All right. And a few future questions. Um, what do Turkers know that we don't? You know, can we identify interpretable features from the signal content? Um, human intuition has its limits. When is this a predictive feature and when is this just noise? And then one final thing, so adding on to what you guys were saying earlier, is you know, what exactly is this, are, is this crowd prediction data doing? Why is it predictive? And how does it compare <coughs> to training data in which we just elicited a play? Okay. All right. So I'll take questions and I'll leave up. We asked subjects at the end, you know, how did you make predictions? So these are some of the answers I, thought, I found sort of funny. I mean, their, their predictions are pretty good, but these are the, the reasons they're giving us. <laughs>